from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the fifth and final part of Every Photo is a Story. I'm Christy Feinfield, Reference Librarian in the Prints and Photographs Division at the Library of Congress. Historian Sam Waters and I are now going to talk about the stories of these photographs. So far, we've learned about a remarkable photographer, Frances Benjamin Johnston, about her garden photographs, we've explored the times she lived in, and we've looked at the influence which she incorporated into her work. So what are the stories of these photographs? What stories can we now tell? Sam, when you first encountered the Lantern Slide Collection, you discovered well over a thousand slides, few with identifying labels or dates, and in no discernible order. Through the techniques we've discussed in the past four parts, you discovered what seemed to be an almost random jumble of images, beautiful images, but a jumble nonetheless, was actually a coherent body of work. What did you learn as a whole about this collection through your work with it? Well. Um, the, the significant part is to imagine that you have a thousand photographs and they're not identified and you just come to them mm -hmm. and they don't seem to have any coherent relationship. And what um, you learn in studying along the lines that we discussed, which is to consider the influences, mm -hmm. to consider uh, the time that Johnston lived in, Johnston herself, the problems of aesthetics, what kind of photogra photographs that people wanted, who, who bought the photographs, who saw the photographs. You walk away with a very clear, what's surprising is, is that it is very ordered, that mm. they were all done in a certain period of time, that there has a sequence to when the photographs mm -hmm. are taken, and you walk away with essentially those photographs telling you another part of the Johnston story. Wow. And what does it tell you maybe about that time? Well, in America, I mean, it, as you've seen, it's going to tell you about how people lived, basically how very wealthy people lived, and how the rich uh, considered uh, their gardens and houses as important models mm -hmm. for America. These were uh, perfected images, as we've seen, the perfect blue pool, the perfect uh, landscape with the live oak. Mm -hmm. You've seen the tidy gardeners. You've seen many images uh, that show you what people believed America should look like. Wow. This was supposed to be a greener and more beautiful country. So there's a much bigger story there than just Absolutely. a single image of a garden. And I think that pretty yeah. much that's always true, that yeah. the story is always bigger than the single photograph. Um, so, to kind of focus in a little bit, we've talked uh, numerous times about the Arthur Curtis James estate, the blue garden in it. So, we've touched on it through all the parts, but what can you tell me, what's the story of Johnston encountering this garden, and what story does she tell about it? What, what, what you learn about this garden is, um, remember the times when we said this is a garden created uh, in the period of the City Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And we remember also that Johnston was showing uh, these photographs of that garden and of the slides mm -hmm. to a broad public audience. Mm -hmm. Now, in our research, what did we learn uh, about what she might have said about the garden um, and what was significant in the garden? Because she, we still don't know that, right? Because she mm. didn't write down uh, what she lectured. Oh, no so notes. you're going to okay. have to <laughs> determine that from what did people think about in those times and also from her literature. So what do we know uh, about some pictures that we've seen of that garden? Uh, if you remember very early on, mm -hmm. we came on that surprising photograph uh, where you see the pergola had changed. Oh, it was different, the little image. The little, the mm -hmm. little uh, uh, postcard was different from what Johnson said. Well, if you read through uh, manuscripts and take enough time, you find out that the Jameses changed the garden oh. uh, from its original, uh, the way it was originally designed. They had many problems planting it, mm -hmm. and they also changed some of the structures in oh. the garden. And you see uh, the difference, that th that's what you learn. So we now know that one thing is that Johnston likely uh, would have known all that mm -hmm. and said, well, the garden evolved. Now, what is the significant um, feature of this garden uh, is th its blueness. Right. We know that it was called the Blue Garden, and remember the slide where we talked about the slide mm -hmm. artist making the pool. This Here pool. it is, a super blue. Right. right? It's now, a blue not seen. <laughs> that's right. And we have to now wonder, 
So what was significant about the blue? Well, if you read enough, and we have, uh, remember the book of, about, uh, by Earl mm -hmm. about the Old Con Gardens? Right. Well, if you, which we know Johnston owned and was very prominent in the period, okay. uh, we know uh, if you read in that book, you find out that the reason blue gardens were very uh, revered was they were associated with Persia. Oh, and back to remember Persia. back to the Persia Garden, mm -hmm. and we had that comparison of the two gardens together, the, the Shalimar Garden and the James Garden. So if we have that influence of Persia, and we know that this is a city beautiful period when Americans were very concerned with making themselves this world power mm, to mm -hmm. compete with what was then the height of culture, which was the Western world. Because America was still pretty young. America was very young. It was yeah. a century old. Right. And uh, what did you look to? You look back to these um, periods of great cultural development. And Persia, mm -hmm. and Rome, and Paris, and London, these were all deeply significant to Americans. So what is it that we can now imagine that Frances Benjamin Johnston talked about in her lectures? If we could write a scenario, mm -hmm. which is, it's very easy to imagine her because we know parts of what she said, is that she stood up and said, that Mrs. James mm -hmm. uh, built this garden out of a rocky uh, part of the, of the coast of Rhode Island, which mm -hmm. was significantly attached to the colonial past in America. And in this, she basically created her own Persian-American Mediterranean wow. garden, wow. which was meant that Mrs. James was a cultured, well-traveled, reading, literate person. And that she sows the slides of this garden means that Mrs. James mm -hmm. was willing to share both that culture with other people who were not as fortunate and also probably to show off. Yeah, to her friends. That, to her who rich also friends. Felt they were it was cultured. very much, uh, yeah. you know, uh, a friend and I a joke that uh, when America was young, it was uh, keeping up with Washington. <laughs> and by the end of the 19th century, it was keeping up with the Vanderbilts. Ah, and, <laughs> and she was you, literally keeping up with And the there Vanderbilts. we are in Newport, mm -hmm. and who were her neighbors but the Vanderbilts. So there's always a question of pride and, that, and influence. And photographs have that, because always remember, photographs are meant to be seen mm -hmm. by somebody other than the photographer. Fantastic. So there's a story of far beyond just a blue pool in the yard. It's uh, not just <laughs> a big uh, swimming story. in the backyard. Right. Yeah. So this garden, um, Newport, still a place that people go and have nice homes and gardens. What's the state mm -hmm. of this garden today? Well, interestingly, this garden, the very, um, the, the, the pool structures basically still remain. Wow, the garden years flower, later. Uh, this is, this, these gardens were enormous. It required lots of upkeep and labor uh, to keep them looking this way that you see them in the book here. But this garden has been brought by a philanthropist, and they're in the process of actually restoring it. So we might have an opportunity to revisit the Blue Garden I am sometime certain, in the near future. I am future. certain we will all see what this garden looks like, again, through magazines and newspapers and now the web. A hundred years later, we're back. <laughs> Here we are. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, so let me uh, wrap up, do a little recap of what we've just learned. So through your book and the online presentation of Francis Benjamin Johnston's Lantern Slides, this collection is now available for future researchers to study. People can pursue their own stories, just like we have with the Blue Garden. That's why the library's collections are so exciting to work with. There are stories just waiting for you to find them. Let's review our top tips for every photo is a story, reflecting back on all five parts of our series. The top tips are, look closely at the photographs. Learn about who took the picture. Consider the photographic technology and the audience. Search for related written information and apply general research skills. Ask lots of questions and ask for help. Seek out reference librarians archivists, historians, and other experts in the field you're studying. Please visit the website Every Photo is a Story for the final Try It Yourself Challenge, where we ask you to explore a garden on your own. Sam, I want to thank you for your time today and for your research into the beautiful garden world captured by Francis Benjamin Johnston. I've learned a lot, and I hope our viewers have too.
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.